All right, uh, let's begin since we're a bit behind here. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties, um, but welcome. Welcome to the special Valentine's Day edition of the Vault API. Now, when it comes to romantic, uh, you really can't beat the job server. It's really the most romantic thing. And actually, while we're at it, I mean, if you're looking for the perfect Valentine's Day gift uh, this year, uh, don't go with chocolates or roses or something like that. Um, why not give the gift a vault uh, this Valentine's Day? Anyway, uh, a bit about me. Um, uh, my name's Doug Redmond. I'm a Gemini. I like long walks in the beach. Uh, my hobbies include computers, computer programming, and vault. By the way, if you're if you're viewing the recording, just pretend it's Valentine's Day. Then the jokes will make a lot more sense. Um, anyway, uh, let me uh, kind of go over the the series so far. So uh, part one was just kind of an overview of uh, some of the programming rules, the different areas of customization from like a high level, and then parts two through five, I drill down onto specific topics. So part two uh, talked a lot about uh, communicating with the vault sir sorry, um, communicating with the vault server. Um, part three was about customizing the vault explorer application, you know how to add custom commands and things like that. Uh, today's session will be about the job server, and uh, I put the skill level at intermediate because uh, dealing with the job queue. I wouldn't call it hard, but it 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 can be a stumbling block if you've never really dealt with this sort of thing before. Uh, and even uh, some of the professional programmers get stumped on some of the concepts. Um, so so yeah, this is uh, you know I'd call this an intermediate class. Um, and then part five is about the event uh, hooks that we've put in to the Vault API, and that one is more geared toward professional programmers. Um, and yes, I, I am recording this session. All the sessions are recorded. I will be posting them all when the series is completed. So, and, and I'll be posting everything. The, the sample code I go over, the slides, the video, it, it'll all be up there online on my blog. Okay, uh, a bit about the class today. Um, so the goals of the class, I, I want to kind of describe the architecture of uh, the job server. Uh, I want to kind of show you how you would put your own jobs onto the job queue, and then how you would um, basically take those jobs off the queue and execute them. Uh, the requirements for this class, you have to know what Vault is. Um, I will talk, if you're not familiar with Job Server, I am actually going to kind of explain what that is. Um, but still, it, it's helpful if you know what Vault is and, and the features and things like that. Um, also, some level of programming experience. Like I said, this, this is a bit more in-depth, um, or at least the concepts are a bit more uh, uh, difficult than in the past couple sessions. Um, but still, if, if, if you've been programming for a while, you should be able to pick up on it. So the, this is kind of a, a brief outline of, uh, of this session. So I'm, I'm going to start with an overview, as always. So I'll talk about Vault, and then I'll kind of drill down into uh, the job server. Um, I'll do a video demo. Again, I'll, I'll be playing a video showing you how you would build this this um, customization from scratch. Uh, and then I'm going to go deeper into uh, the job server and, and the various programming uh, things you need to worry about when you're, when you're customizing this. And then uh, we'll do Q&A at the end. Um, so there should be a questions box. Um, and you can type in questions at any time. So uh, I, I won't be able to get to them until the end, but feel free to ask questions at any time, or at least type it in. Okay, moving along. Okay, so let's start with, with an overview here. 
So we'll start with the vault architecture. This is the same kind of diagram I've been showing uh, for all the sessions. And um, in this case, we are going to be customizing the job processor, which is a utility that's part of the client that is uh, basically for taking jobs off the queue and executing them. So that's the component we're plugging into. Now, the feature is called job server, but if you notice, this box is on the client side. Um, and that's just, um, it, it, it's just because that us as developers, um, sometimes the technical meaning is different than the user facing meaning. So from the user's point of view, you know, when, when they're doing something and they're putting, uh, you know, they're, they're doing actions and things are going on the queue in the background. In the user's mind, it's happening on the server. But us as programmers, we know that it actually doesn't happen on the server. It, it happens on client side, and it's a special client called Job Processor. Now, of course, you can run Job Processor on the server, but, you know, from, from kind of a technical point of view, Job Processor is a client to the server. So... Again, this follows the same rules that I've established before in terms of server communication. Um, all communication with the server is going to go through the Web Services API. So we're still, all those rules that I've told you before still apply here. The job queue doesn't use any type of backdoors or anything. We're still doing client-side programming. <clears throat> okay, so the point of this whole session really is to explain how you would create your own job types, put them on the queue, and then take them off the queue and execute them. So those are kind of all the things I'm going to be going over here. Now to talk a bit about the, the feature itself, the job server feature. So uh, this feature is available in Vault Workgroup, Collaboration, and Professional. It's not available in Base Vault. But the idea is you can take work and you can distribute it to other computers um, through the use of a centralized queue. Uh, and that queue is maintained by the server. So the, the queue is actually on you know, ADMS. And you interact with it um, through the web service calls. Um, now, I, I should probably explain what I mean when I say job, right? Well, one way to define job is, well, it's a thing you put on this queue. Um, but, but the real meaning is it's supposed to be a kind of a well-defined unit of work. So like out of the box, we have a couple of, um, of jobs predefined. So we've got a dwif generate job, which will take a CAD file and generate a dwif for it. Uh, I believe there's a property sync job, which will take vault properties and write them into the CAD file. And I think we've got a revision block job for, um, I know it's for inventor files. I'm, I'm not, off the top of my head, I don't know if it supports other types, but the idea is you, you have your revision data and you can write it inside of your inventor drawing in, in the, you can create a block. Um, inside of the drawing and, and it will fill out all the revisions for you. So, so those are kind of examples and the idea is, well, um, if you want to do more, you can kind of define your own. Now here's the part that actually stumps a lot of people, even people who have been programming for years and years and, and decades. Um, when you do this customization, there's two parts to it. Part one, you have to get the job on the queue. Part two is taking the job off the queue and doing something with it. Uh, if you do one of these steps and not the other, you, you don't have anything, right? If you only do step one, the result is going to be a bunch of jobs sitting on the queue forever. And if you only do step two, you're going to have code that never executes because no jobs ever go on the queue for it to handle. So, you know, it... it it sounds kind of easy when I when I say it, but when you're programming it, it does feel a bit weird. It's kind of like mailing yourself a letter. Um, 
instead of doing the thing right away, right, let's say you want to generate a PDF file, right, normally you would just code up the logic for, for doing that. But when you're doing when you're dealing with the job server, you have to write some code to create the job, and then you just turn around immediately and write the job, or, or you write the code to uh, actually do the work. Um, so when you're writing it up, it feels kind of weird, but of course you have to know in your head, okay, these things are going to be running on separate components and and at separate times and on separate computers, and you have to kind of mentally uh, get that break in there but 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 yeah this is this believe it or not this is the biggest stumbling block is people will forget one of these two steps usually it's the first step people forget about <clears throat> so let me talk about the first step getting the job on the queue uh, and this is the easiest part um, I, don't, I don't really have many slides on this um, so there's two ways of doing it uh, way number one is you use the web service API. You go to the job service and you call the add job function. Um, now I've been showing you, uh, you know, various um, uh, customization techniques. So, you know, where you where you make this add job call, um, uh, you can do it from any places, right? You can maybe have your own exe that can put things on the job or maybe you've got like a custom command uh, in Vault Explorer that could add a job um, and then you know uh, on Thursday when I talk about event hooks um, you can actually do this from your events so there, th there's a lot of options as to when to call this code but the basic idea is you you explicitly talk to the server and you you create that job the second way to get a job on the queue is to do it on a lifecycle state change. So as part of the SDK, there's a utility called the lifecycle event editor. And you use that to configure the server and tell it which jobs are going to get fired on which lifecycle transitions. Um, so let me talk about that a bit more. So here's kind of what it looks like. Um, and in this example, I'm kind of showing a file. You can do you, you can do this for files, items, and change orders. Um, but so in the case of file, you have to select the lifecycle definition at the top. So I'm saying for the flexible release process, whenever we go from work in progress to released, I want this job to go on the queue. This job that that um, the type is Autodesk.CustomJobType. Um, so what that's going to do is through this tool you you configure everything. Um, when you're done, you're going to hit there's like a commit button. So you you write the changes to the server, and the server is going to remember that. And what's going to happen is any time a file goes through this transition, work in progress to released, the server is going to queue up a job for you. You don't have to call add job explicitly. The server will add the job. Um, okay, so just some more bullet points. So I mentioned this tool's in the SDK. The source code is also in the SDK. So um, if you kind of want to, uh, if you want to explicitly make these settings and you don't want to force the user to have to use the tool, um, you can you can look at how it's done in in the uh, in the SDK. Again, all all of my communication with the servers through the web service API. So, you know, feel free to, uh, to, to borrow that code if you want to. Um, so yeah, I mentioned this, this utility doesn't actually create the jobs itself. It just tells the server when to create jobs. Uh, so the server will fire, will create the jobs for you. Also, another kind of nice thing is that it's part of the server operation. So let's say that the lifecycle transition fails, then it's not going to queue a job. Um, and, and this is guaranteed. Either, either the transition works and you get a job or it fails and you don't get a job. You're never going to be in this weird state where you get a job but the operation failed or something like that. So that's kind of nice. You have kind of a guaranteed delivery mechanism. Okay, so that um, 
that's all I have on getting the job on the queue. The rest of what I'm going to talk about is mostly about um, uh, executing the job. Uh, so the recommended way to do that is to write an add-in to this job processor exe utility, which is part of the client install. You'll just get this automatically. If you look in your um, your uh, client explorer folder, you'll find job processor exe sitting there. Um, so we're going to build an extension. Um, and this is this should start looking familiar right now. This is going to be a .NET DLL. And inside of it, you have the freedom to do pretty much anything. However, we do discourage UI. Um, and the reason is because Job Processor EXE is supposed to run as a service. It's not really a service, but you're, you're supposed to think of it like a service. Um, so the idea is that your Vault Admin is going to start this thing up on a computer, and then the computer is just going to run on its own forever. Um, so if if you've got your plugin and your plugin pops up a dialog, well guess what? You've just locked up job processor because no one's going to be there to click OK on it. So please don't have any UI. But everything else you can do, connecting to other systems, um, you know, writing to files on disk, all of that type of thing, you, you have the freedom to do that. And again, because we're in .NET, you've got your choice of languages that you want to use. <clears throat> Um, so, uh, you know, I've talked about this thing called a job, um, so let's get a bit more technical. Um, if, if you're working in code, what, you know, what does that look like? Hopefully you can read the text there, it's kind of small, but I, I kind of printed out what the class looks like. So, um, the class is called iJob, and it's got some parameters. I'm not going to go over all of them, but there are some ones that are really important. So job type is very important. This basically is, um, it indicates what task you want to do. And this, um, jobs get routed based on their type. So if you wanted to write, you know, a, a, um, something that creates a PDF file, you would, um, you would make sure that the job type indicates that. Um, and then when you write your handler, you, you have to look for that string that you set. So, so yeah, job type's just a string that you set, um, and it's used by the Vault framework to route the job to your handler. Um, now, as far as Vault, the Vault server is concerned, it doesn't really care what string you put in there. Um, we do recommend, though, you put your company name first, so that way you don't collide with any other customizations that might be in place. Um, but but uh, yeah, the the server really doesn't care about it, and and this is going to be a theme for a lot of the job queue. You can uh, you can put things on there, but the the server is not really going to do any type of enforcement for you. Um, the other thing that I want to point out on here is this thing called params, which um, in this object is a dictionary. Um, it's it's basically a set of name value pairs, and these name value pairs uh, tell the handler, well, that the, they provide information that the handler needs to do the job. And what, what that is exactly is different for each job type. So again, if we're talking about a PDF generator, uh, what would we need in, in here? Well, you're, you, we would need some way to find the file that we want to generate a PDF on, right? So you'd probably have the vault file ID in here, or maybe the path to the file or something, some way to uniquely find that file. Uh, and that would be a required parameter. If, if you didn't have that, your handler would just have to throw an error, right? Uh, let's see, what other parameters might we have? Um, maybe there's different PDF options you want to have, like the size of the page or something. That could be a parameter, but maybe it's not a required parameter, maybe it's optional. Meaning if, if, if a job comes in and that parameter is not there, well, you've got some default settings and, and you don't have to throw an error. So, so that's just kind of an example of, of what you're meant to do with this. 
so um and and it's perfectly fine to have no parameters too it you know it depends on what you're doing so you know the this um the set of parameters is not fixed it's something you have complete control to define and again the server is not going to care about it um uh is <laughs> you know it'll just kind of store the data and then give it back to your handler but it's not going to do any type of validation check or anything on this data um, <clears throat> okay um, a lot more just kind of the filling in the gaps here going going deeper into all the little intricacies <clears throat> So I mentioned before, job processor exe is supposed to be a service. Um, we would have liked to have done it as a, a real Windows service, but um, there were some technical reasons we couldn't. So it's its its, it's own exe that has to be launched. Um, so job processor works by polling, which means that every um, you know it, it it'll go idle for a certain period of time. Then when that time is up, it's going to check the queue. If it doesn't get anything on the queue, it's going to go back to sleep for another time period. Uh, the time period is 10 minutes by default. Um, uh, if it wakes up and there's jobs on the queue, it will just execute them one by one until there's no more jobs on the queue, and then it goes back to sleep. Um, if you want to change the interval, you can do that in in that job processor config file. Uh, but it, it's always uh, the the quickest you can make it is one minute. <clears throat> now, if you want, you can have multiple job processors running on a network, so that's um, perfectly allowed. And if you're doing bulk operations, sometimes that's that's a good idea. Like you're doing a, you know, it, it's the weekend, you're loading a bunch of CAD data in there, you want a bunch of DWIF files, so you take all of these idle computers you have and you, you start up Job Processor and then they can all just chug away at DWIFs uh, for the weekend or something like that. Um, you, can you, can you can specialize your Job Processors so that each processor handles different types. So again, in that config file, um, let's say you want something that only does DWIF generation, you can comment out all the other job types so that it only does DWIF. And then he, you know, that, that processor is nice and specialized. Um, okay, here's one that, that nobody's really happy with. Um, when the job processor is running, it's going to consume a license. When it's idle, it won't. But if it's actually doing something, if like if it's creating a, a DWIF, um, in order to create that DWIF and to check it in, it has to be logged in to Vault. And like I've said in my in, in a couple of other sessions, when you log in, it consumes a license. Because the job processor follows the same rules that every other app follows, um, a license is going to be consumed for this. So that's something to be aware of. <clears throat> uh, and then the, my last point uh, on this is that you, uh, for a given computer, you can only have one job processor running at a time. You can't just create four of them and, and do things in parallel. It's computer can only have one running. <clears throat> Okay, so a couple things about using uh, the queue. Uh, I've mentioned before that the Vault server doesn't really care what you put on the queue. That's um, it's it's your burden as a developer to make sure that um, the code that puts the job on the queue matches the code that takes the job off the queue. If, like I said, if you if you're queuing up the job and you make a typo, that's it's not going to get routed properly. Or if you forget to put a parameter on there that's critical, you're going to get a bunch of errors. So the burden's on you to make sure all that is lines up at runtime. Um, 
Okay, the thing about the queue is it's asynchronous. You, uh, when you queue it up, when you call add job, it's going to go immediately on the job, but you don't know how long it's going to sit on the queue. Uh, maybe you're first in line, which means that the next time job processor wakes up, it's going to get to it. Or there might be a thousand things in front of it on the queue, and it could take days before it gets to your job. So keep that in mind. If, if you're doing something that needs to happen right away, then don't use the job queue. Job queue is for kind of distributed tasks or, or tasks that don't need to be in real time. Uh, and this last bullet's another one that's kind of hard for some people to wrap their head around. The order is not guaranteed. Um, so let's say you put job A on the queue and then um, later on job B goes on the queue, right? So A is before B. That doesn't actually mean that A is going to get executed and completed first before B. Like I said, there might there, there's many job processors on the network. One of them could grab A, another one could grab B, and the one that grabs B is just a faster computer and, and you know, it, it gets done quicker, right? Um, so here, let me give you an analogy. Let's say you're at the bank, right? Uh, and every bank I've been to, you've got a single line and then you've got multiple tellers and they, the tellers just grab the next person in line. So you're in line at the bank. Uh, there's a person in front of you. So you're second in line. Um, and, you know, there, there's a bunch of tellers. <clears throat> so my question is, which one of you is going to leave the bank first? You or the person in front of you? Uh, the answer to the question is, I don't know, because, you know, that depends on what the person in front of you is going to be doing at the bank. Maybe the person in front of you is going to be doing something that's going to take a long time. They've got a big jar of pennies, and they're going to count them out one by one, and you're just going to cash a check or something. Um, also, you know, maybe the guy in front of you gets the slow teller right the 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 new person who doesn't know how to do anything yet and you know she has to constantly call the manager and be like well how do i do this thing and that takes forever right and 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 when it's your turn maybe you get the expert who who's much quicker and then you're out the bank first so it's the same type of thing with the job queue you you just because something goes in first doesn't mean it's going to actually complete first so if you've got something that is order dependent, in other words, you have to do something to completion before the next thing can happen, um, don't do it by queuing up two jobs. So in Vault, uh, we actually have this case in, in, in the default jobs. Uh, there's this thing where you can sync properties and then generate a DWIF because uh, you want those properties to be in the DWIF. So what we do is we, we create one job. One job goes on the queue that's, that syncs the properties. When that job completes, it queues up a DWIF job, and then, uh, and then it's done handling that job. So it, it, it's kind of a chain. One job queues up another job, and then later on that DWIF generate job is going to get executed by a different set of code. So... That's kind of how you can do orders. You can basically have uh, one job queuing up another job. <clears throat> There's a couple of other ways you can deal with it, too. Okay, so let's say you're a Vault administrator. How do you actually manage this job queue? Uh, we've got built-in UI for that. So if you go to, um, to Vault Explorer, and I, you know, I showed this in the demo. You, you, there's a window where you can see the job queue. So you can do a bunch of useful stuff. You can see what's on the queue. You can delete things off the queue manually. If a job's failed, you can resubmit it. Um, so, so this can come in handy if. Um, you know, you fix the problem or maybe the network went down or something and that's why the job failed and then later on when the network comes back up, you just resubmit the job and then it, it'll work hopefully the next time through. Um, and you can also view metadata about the job uh, with this uh, 
with this queue um, window. So this is what it looks like. Not much more to say there. Um, there is kind of a hidden feature though. Um, let's say you get into this case where your handler grabs the job, uh, which will put it into a processing mode. It'll say it, it'll say processing in in this job queue uh, window. Um, so so you've reserved the job, and then you crash. The whole or maybe the power goes out or something. The the job processor dies and you never get to you don't get to mark the job as success or failure it's in this limbo state how do you recover from that we've got a command that's hidden you have to edit the menus and I kind of show you how to do that in the screenshot there's this reset to queue button and what you do is you you make that command visible and then you run that on the job and that will basically move it back into a pending state. So that's how you handle that case. It's kind of, I don't know why we chose to hide that button, but someone thought that was a good idea. So, okay, moving on to a couple other just miscellaneous topics, um, things you might run into. Um, okay, let me talk a bit about multi-site and multi-workgroup. Um, these are really big concepts. I can't go into them that much uh, in this session. But the quick uh, definition is that multi-site means you've got uh, multiple ADMS instances running inside of a, a, a web server. And you've got multiple file stores. Um, but with multi-site, they share a, a single database. Then we've got this concept of multi-workgroup, which means you actually have a fully replicated database. So you've got one installed of SQL Server in New York, for example. You've got another SQL Server installed in Hong Kong, and they synchronize data periodically. So that's multi-workgroup. You can also mix and match between the two, uh, just to make it ultra, ultra complex. So you can have replicated databases with replicated sites. Um, very confusing and uh, the way jobs work is is kind of um, counterintuitive it, it, it when I first started uh, working with it I, I got stumped on this a bit so when you reserve a job you can only reserve it from the site that queued it up so when you know when you queue up a job with add job you're connected to a site and that job is bound to that site and can't be reserved from any other site. Why we did this, um, I, I'm not going to go into why we did this. We did, we do have a reason for it, but you know, it's when you're programming it up, it's just going to be um, something that that might cause you some frustration. Um, so that's on the reserve now. When you look at the job queue, it's going to show everything, regardless of what site queued it up. And there's no way to really tell which jobs are from what uh, site. So that's kind of confusing as well because you can, you know, you can, it, it, for example, if, if you have a bunch of jobs uh, queued on another site, you can see them all in the job queue. You can start up your job processor, but it's not going to do anything because it can't get any of those jobs and you're going to wonder why. Um, it, it might be because of this, this site issue. <clears throat> and, and it's the same at the API level. You call get jobs by date, it gives you this list of things, but that doesn't mean you can reserve those things and process them. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of on the to-do list to, to give a bit more information in these cases, but for Vault 2012, there's no easy way to tell what jobs come from what sites. Now, I should mention, um, because I had to deal with this and, and it made me quite angry, um, I built something called QTools, which is designed to mitigate some of this pain. Um, so QTools, it, it does a lot of things, but um, 
uh, related to this multi-site thing, you can actually have this thing move jobs from one queue to the other. So, uh, for example, um, I created this uh, this um, job handler that sends out email notifications, and our internal vault is replicated to five different um, uh, databases. You know, I didn't want to configure job processor five different times. I only wanted to do it for the one um, that's local to me. So I hooked up queue tools, and queue tools would basically, if if any of these notification jobs were created from, uh, let's say, the uh, the Singapore office, that would get copied to the office in the United States, and um, I'd only have to deal with one job processor. So that's kind of one way you can work around it is is you can get queue tools and and I should mention that this is this is on my blog which means it's not really an official Autodesk product it's just kind of a sample app um, so if if you use this it kind of just make sure that it it works for you and everything um, but but I haven't really heard uh, of many issues with it <clears throat> Okay, another topic, uh, priority. When you add a job to the queue, you're going to give it a priority value. And <sighs> let me explain what this is for, right? Um, this is for cases where you're doing a bunch of bulk operations, but you want them to happen in the background, right? Um, you've loaded a bunch of files. They need DWIFs created for them you know up front that this is probably going to take a week or so. You just want that thing to chug away in the background. In the meantime, people are still using Vault. They're still adding new data. And you want to make sure that the stuff they're doing gets processed relatively quickly. So what you can do is you, um, uh, with priority, it, it basically is a hint as to which jobs are more important than other jobs. So that way the user's stuff can get executed. It basically gets to cut in line is, is what priority does. Um, but again, going back to that bank analogy, you still things can still get executed out of order because of how you know the multiple processors get set up or the fact that um, these processors can get specialized. So don't use this as an ordering mechanism. Uh, just use it. Uh, basically to kind of distinguish between things that, that are more important than other things. Uh, okay, yeah, so the way it works is that the lower the number, the higher the priority. So priority one is the lowest number allowed, so that means that's going to be the highest priority. Um, I should have put this on the slide deck, but um, the default priority um, that, that we have in, in Vault 2012 is that if it's like a user operation, like a check-in, and the check-in tw triggers like a DWIF job, that's going to go in at priority 10. So that's kind of our little default number. And if you do things through autoloader, that's going to go in as priority 100. So those are kind of the baseline numbers that we've kind of established at, at Autodesk. So you can kind of fit your priorities in based on that. So if you think your thing is more important than a check-in operation with DWIF generation, then you can have it uh, a priority higher than 10. Or if if you think it's more of a background, you can put it in as priority 100. So that's kind of what we've, we've tried to establish. <clears throat> Once you queue the job, you can't change the priority on it. Uh, of course, you could always write a customization that takes the job off the queue and then puts it on the queue again with a different priority. That That's possible, but um, there's no way to edit it without taking it off the queue like that. <clears throat> okay, uh, here's a nice little tip that I recommend. Um, when you write this extension, uh, you can actually put more than one extension type in a single assembly. So let's say you want to do a custom uh, command in Vault Explorer and you want to do a custom job handler. You can put those in the same DLL. Um, <clears throat> so uh, why this is good is because you're going to have a bunch of logic 
well, like I said before, you want you want your code to be in sync, right? When you when you add the job of a certain job type, you have to make sure that that text is exactly the same as what the handler is looking for. Well, if they're both in the same DLL, that makes it really easy. You can just reference the same uh, exact string or the same class. I, I find it's good to actually create your own class that represents that job, and then that class basically is in charge of queuing itself up and and handling itself so um, very nice technique very useful um, so yeah you put it all in one one DLL one reset config file an example already exists in the SDK if you go to the job processor API samples it has this exact thing it's got a custom command and a custom uh, job handler all in one package So that, that kind of leads me to the, my, uh, my slide on extensions, the fact that when you're extending Vault functionality, when you're writing this DLL and this DLL is being loaded into Vault, there's this common set of rules you have to follow, right? The, the assembly attributes, uh, the deployment to program data, the vset config file, these all are things you have to do. Now, job processor uh, extensions have that extra step where you have to go into job uh, processor exe config. Uh, but other than that, it follows the, the same rules that a custom command follows. So that, again, that kind of consolidates things a bit. Um, OK, another thing that I just feel I should mention. Um, we recommend you use job processor, but that is not a hard requirement. Um, because everything goes over web service um, functions, and we've we've opened up that API. Uh, technically, you can do everything without job processor. You can just talk to the queue directly to to pull jobs off the queue. Um, and you know there there are times you might want to go that route. And in fact, I'm I'm currently working on a project that it it uses the job queue, but we're not plugging into job processor. So. Uh, I'll just kind of list some advantages and disadvantages. So, um, so one of the nice advantages of Job Processor is that it's a centralized. Um, it, it provides centralized administration. So, if you can imagine that you're the the administrator of a vault, it's much easier if you only have to deal with one program, right? Than than having five different services running that you always have to you know kind of maintain and 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 if something fails you have to kind of hunt down okay well what service broke or what application broke um, if everything goes through job processor it's only one single spot it's one log file it, it makes it very easy to find problems and maintain and everything um, so job processor has built-in logging in in it so if something goes wrong, you notify Job Processor. Job Processor writes it into its log file. So all of that's taken care of. Um, and it, it forces kind of a best practices approach. In other words, Job Processor is going to give you things one job at a time. And you have to think in isolation. <clears throat> if you're building your own app, you're going to get really tempted to do things like scan the whole queue and collect up like, like, you know, if you're expecting um, uh, jobs to get queued in pairs, like job A and job B will always get queued together, right? You're, you're going to kind of be tempted to, to kind of scan through and collect up different jobs and handle them together and stuff. And that's not really how you're supposed to use a queuing system. Um, so if you go through job processor, you're kind of forced to go this way. And, and I think that's a good thing. Um, but anyway, um, the, but you know there are some disadvantages. So so let me talk about those a bit. I mentioned before it's not a Windows service, which is kind of a big downer because uh, you know you'd really like to be able to do the um, uh, you, you've got that nice uh, control panel um, window where you can start and stop the services and and monitor everything and and do command line operations. Um, so you don't get any of that with Job Processor, at least not in Vault 2012. 
Um, <laughs> job processor is only going to connect to one server at a time. Um, uh, job processor doesn't really do much in terms of parallel processing, like pulling multiple jobs off the queue and spawning other threads to kind of handle things in parallel. Um, it's it's basically a, a single threaded application. So uh, another thing I probably should have put on the slide is that job processor consumes a license when it runs. And um, that's one of the big factors in the project I'm working on. The thing I'm doing is read only. So I don't want to consume a license if I don't have to. If, if I did it through job processor, I would be forced to consume a license because job processor handles the login for you. So you actually can't tell it, oh, don't, don't, you know, login is read only for me. Uh, there's no way you can do that with job processor. Whereas if you've got your own service, you, uh, you have that ability. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, that's mostly it for my, my talk. Um, those are kind of the, the, the main things I've run into and, and kind of the stumbling blocks uh, if, if you're getting started. Uh, if you want more information about, you know, Vault programming, um, you know, the same slide as in my other sessions, except for the hearts, of course. Um, uh, the SDK is a great resource. I've got my own blog, which is where I'm going to be posting this video. Um, the Autodesk Developer Network supports everything I've been talking about. So you can use Dev Help Online if you get stuck. Um, and there's a discussion group for Vault API topics. So <clears throat> anyway, I um, hope you found this informative. Uh, at this time, I would like to do questions. So if you've got a question, please type it in now. Let me see if I've got any questions.